Video equipment rental costs paid for by peep code screencasts. So I gave a lightning talk at the Mountain West Ruby conference on this topic, and I did a lot of hand waving, and I was trying to get it done in five minutes. I think I got it done in uh, nine or 10, so I failed at that. But uh, that lightning talk, I wasn't planning on doing it. I got there, um, you know, noticed a lot of Macs, and just wanted to go over uh, Ruby Cocoa and developing desktop applications on OS X with Ruby. Um, and we'll go ahead. And this is the schedule. So I'll talk about why me, what have I done that uh, lets me stand up here. Um, what Coco is, what Ruby Coco is, go over some examples of applications you may have used that are actually Ruby Coco applications. Uh, do a quick demo. Uh, so it'll be like the lightning talk, but I'll uh, take more time and walk through it some more. And we'll talk about the future of where uh, Ruby Coco is going um, and some other stuff. So the who am I? I'm from Boise, Idaho. I spent most of my um, paid software development career working for Equalogic. Um, this was the best image I could find because they were purchased by Dell in January and I quit. Um, and I'm now an independent contractor under the name of uh, Rubisoft and I also developed some apps. Ruvid, um, both of these apps actually were done while I was at Equalogic. Let's you just drop uh, videos on and it saves profile so it'll um, resize your video and whatnot. And Reswitch um, lets you create profiles for any application, any Cocoa application. So you can have uh, two copies of your address book for work and home and whatnot. Uh, that received a design award from Apple and some other people like it. <laughs> uh, when I started getting into Ruby and Rails, um, I started the side project, Simply Invoices. It uh, generates invoices. And so I contract for Macala Media doing uh, Rails stuff. Uh, catalogchoice.org is coming up on its million, millionth user. Uh, MLK.com is a German um, band promotion site for concerts. And we're currently working on this uh, writing our future where students are writing to the next president. And it's going to be published on a map and whatnot. I'm a father of these two. <laughs> They get along. <laughs> um, so what is Coco? Coco is not this chocolatey drink. In this case, that was Coco. But uh, it's Apple's um, name for all their Objective-C uh, frameworks. So it covers things like QuickTime, uh, Address Book, Bonjour, <laughs> uh, Quartz, um, all the display stuff, Core Graphics, Core Animation, Core Sound, or Core Audio, rather. Um, and it comes from Next. So when uh, Apple purchased Next, they, OS X used to be the Next operating system. And so all the classes that existed at the time are prefixed with NS for Next Step. Um, and they just never change that, never need to. Um, when I was working at Equalogic, I got my first Mac um, off eBay. And I realized I needed to learn, you know, I wanted to learn how to uh, program on it and how to uh, develop native applications for this platform that I'm falling in love with. And I noticed that uh, compared to the embedded systems type work I was doing, um, Coco and Objective-C and uh, just Xcode, the whole platform, really uh, did actually make it quick and efficient. Uh, and the same sort of thing happened when I got into Ruby and Rails. You know, it was like, wow, this is way better than PHP, which I had played with. <coughs> Uh, so Coco is built with Objective-C, and it's not as bad as it sounds. It's actually fairly nice once you get used to the brackets. So it looks like this. Uh, here it's just allocating an array and initializing it with two strings. Um, so there's some sim similarities between Objective-C and Ruby. Um, they both pull some stuff from Smalltalk. But uh, so messages are sent to objects. You don't call functions. You send messages to your objects. It's not strongly typed, um, although it is C. And um, there are definitely types. Um, you can, everything falls back down to um, pointers are passed around, and it works out well. 
classes are kind of open. You can uh, use what they call categories to add methods to classes, but you can't add properties or uh, really do all that you can with Ruby, but uh, you can add to it. Uh, with Leopard, uh, Apple uh, shipped Objective-C2, and that does not have blocks. That has the garbage collection and stuff. In Snow Leopard, they're shipping Objective-C 2.1. It's going to add blocks and uh, some other cool stuff. So it's on the way with Objective-C. I found when I was sort of digging up all this stuff, um, Wikipedia has a really good entry on Objective-C to just go over the highlights and how it's different from C and, and C++ and covers that stuff. So uh, when you're developing a Cocoa application, Ruby Cocoa, um, <laughs> PyOpsC, or whatever it may be, you're going to use Xcode and Interface Builder. They're, you probably have them installed. They come on the uh, OS X disk. They're free. You can register at uh, developer.apple.com if you want the latest or if you don't have it. So Xcode is where you spend most of your time. It has this new Organize feature. Uh, it's new in Leopard. And it sort of just lets you build, you drag your project in there if you want to see uh, a listing of your projects and you know, easier to open them, I guess. Uh, it's new in Leopard. I haven't really gotten into it. I'm not sure of anyone who does. You can see the, the devices. That's where uh, phones show up if you're doing that sort of stuff. It edits if you want. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's a, a pretty good uh, Objective-C editor. It's a pretty bad. Um, Ruby editor, a good example of this is if, if you select some code and you hit the shortcut, the keyboard command to comment out that block of code, it uses C slashes to uh, comment it out. So there's some, and I'm sure they're working on that. You know, it was first an Objective-C editor and they've sort of just put in the Ruby stuff and Python stuff as they've gone along. So it's coming. But uh, you can tell Xcode when you double click on a .rb file, open up your favorite text editor and it'll do that. So it builds, it manages um, the whole build environment. So you can give it tasks. You can create new tasks if you want to work with uh, something in your build stage. So a, a typical example is if you want in your about box, you want it to say 0 0.1 and then in parentheses the uh, git revision or SVN revision. You create a uh, build task that just pulls that, you know, queries that shell script that queries that, puts it into um, what they call your info.plist, which describes your application, and then it shows up there. It's a really good, again, really good Objective C debugger. It's using sitting on top of GDB and uh, the compiler sitting GCC compiler, so it's uh, standard stuff with uh, a pretty front end. Uh, but it's not so good with, or I haven't figured out how to make it so good with Ruby. So I've fallen back. This is the uh, console where you'll see your log statements and stuff. So when I've been doing Ruby Cocoa stuff, I've actually fallen back to doing sort of uh, more printf style debugging, which is unfortunate, but uh, it's not as often that I go there that, than uh, before. And it teaches the documentation. This is within the app, within Xcode. And uh, the Apple's documentation is actually really good. Um, they've got both. This is an example of a um, reference for a class, really good pointers to other places. And they also have these uh, companion guides, and those are really good as well. They sort of just walk you through, uh, you know, this is how you do this, blah, 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 blah. It's pretty good. And I think, you know, they sort of feel obligated to that. Um, Coco is not open source, so they sort of have to give us decent documentation. And it's rarely just flat out wrong. Sometimes there's some steps missing or whatnot, but uh, it's usually pretty good. Interface Builder is where you'll spend your time when you're laying out your UI. Uh, this is what it looks like. And it lets you um, just drag controls on, standard controls. You set their sizes, um, all that sort of thing, and we'll see that in the demo. It's also where you, if you want, is where you sort of glue your code to your interface. And we'll also see that. And we'll talk about that. Uh, so KVC, KVO, and bindings. KVC is key value coding. And at the base of every um, Cocoa class is an NS object. And it defines a set value for key and a value for key function. And um, 
what those do is it lets the caller pass in the string of the attribute that it wants to set. Um, and if, a, if the receiver defines a set FIDO, the set FIDO method is going to be called. If it has the uh, attribute FIDO, it's going to get set. Um, and value for key, same sort of thing. If there's a, um, a method to return FIDO, it's going to call that. Otherwise, it's going to use the default implementation. So here we're just setting uh, number five, and we get it back. And the key value coding works with, uh, always works with objects. So we, have to, we can't just pass in five. We have to say NS number. And the reason for all this is uh, working with bindings. In Interface Builder, you can, so this is Interface Builder. If we were wiring up this slider to um, our app controller and over there, we can see we're wiring, it, wiring up to the uh, FIDO key path, they call it. And that's going to call that set value for key path FIDO. And that's going to set our value. And when they need to know what the value of the slider is, it's going to call um, the get value for key, or value for key, rather. And key value observing is also what bindings, and, uh, what bindings use. And that's because before, in the NS object set value for key, before it actually sets the value, it sends these, uh, this will change value for key, letting the observers know, hey, something's going to change in case they need to know. And then it's also, when it's done, it's going to call uh, did change value for key. And this is just letting the interface know. So if you go behind the scenes and you change FIDO to uh, FIDO plus one in this case, it needs to know that the slider needs to get bumped up. And this is how it does it. It's observing it. It sees it. Uh, and so if you did have this increment FIDO method, you would have to do this uh, will change value for key and then did change value for key if you were using bindings and you needed to uh, have the UI change. So that was all uh, just Coco specific. What is Ruby Coco? Uh, it's a bridge. So it lets us write, talk to the Coco frameworks in Ruby. Um, and you know, as it goes between Ruby and Objective-C, um, Ruby arrays become NS arrays, they're Coco equivalent. Uh, strings become NS strings, and back and forth they go. If there's no um, equivalent, you'll get the, um, the Ruby version of that Coco class. So an example is actually an NS number, which could be a double float. It's just their generic number class. You'll get that back, and you'll have to say 2i or, or whatever it is you want to do to it. This is what Ruby Coco looks like. Um, well, that's what Objective-C looks like. This is what it looks like in Ruby Coco. It's just Ruby. Uh, in this case, because we're using an array, I cheated on this slide. So we're just using brackets, instantiating the array. It's a lot nicer than uh, its Objective-C version. Less uh, words. Uh, uh, Coco is somewhat uh, verbose. And you know, sometimes that's nice, sometimes it's not. One problem when they sort of bridged this was that in Objective-C, the, um, the way methods are defined is the parameters are actually named and broken up like this. So if you wanted to call path for resource, you have to type out you know, whoever you're sending it to, space, path for resource, colon, that parameter you want as the string there, and then use space of type, and then uh, the other parameter that you want. So in Ruby Coco, we can't really do that because it doesn't fly. So what they do is they translate it to this uh, path for resource under of type. So anytime you see a colon, you can just change it to a underscore. And you can also have a trailing underscore because you'll see of type has a trailing colon. They made that optional because it's kind of ugly if it, uh, you always have that trailing. So some examples. Uh, GitNub is useful for, um, it's sort of like GitK if you've ever used it with a Ruby Coco UI on front of it. So it shows you your Git log and you can easily go back and forth between branches and uh, pull out the version numbers and whatnot or just look at the diffs. And while I was preparing this talk, I moved uh, a couple Rails applications over to the ThoughtBot guys um, Hoptoad app. And it just lets you push exceptions up to this uh, web app instead of having them, you know, at the time I was receiving them by email. Um, so now they get pushed up to this app. 
but uh, you know that's good and they're, they're all in a central place and uh, you can click on them and see more details and say okay this one's resolved and that's kind of nice. But uh, I wanted something more immediate uh, to know when an exception happened. And it was a great, they have an API, it was a great um, chance to use Ruby Coco. So I created this Croak app, it's uh, open source on GitHub. It doesn't look so great yet. Um, but it's just, you know, it steals the UI from uh, Twitterific. And it's a Coco app, it's, and it's, but it's Ruby. Uh, Active Resource is behind the API that pulls in the errors. Um, so that was fun to do. And then if you actually go to GitHub and search for Ruby Coco, a good number of like 25 or so projects come back. Uh, some of them larger than others. Um, some of them better code than others. But it, you know, if you wanted to just poke around, see what people are doing, and uh, get some ideas and what's possible and whatnot, they're there. So now we'll dig into the demo now that we've sort of got the uh, Coco and what is Ruby Coco. And it's going to be a really simple demo. It's going to use the faker gem to uh, just generate some random names for us. And then we're going to use Coco to slap them into address book. So we'll go ahead and do that. So we switch to Xcode. I'm actually going to launch something since I restarted. It's not all quite set up how I want. OK. Say so new project. There's a bunch of options. Um, but if you go into the applications under Mac OS X, you have the option for Cocoa Ruby. It's, um, of course, Ruby Cocoa. Ignore what they'll try and tell you. So we're going to call this uh, Friend Faker. And right out of the box, it sort of creates a somewhat uh, a framework of an app. Build and Go just compiles the, uh, what Objective-C there is and copies over the Ruby files. So this is what it looks like. And it resizes. And it's got some menus. I can quit that. And the first thing we're going to do is lay out the user interface. And the, the interface builder works with nib, uh, nibs and now uh, zibs in uh, XIBs in Leopard. Um, and it's basically, in the case of a zib, it's an XML file that defines where your controls are and all this stuff. Uh, a nib is actually a bundle that defines it um, in a more complex way. But we'll leave it as a nib for now. Double click that, and we go to interface builder. And this library over here is the, all the controls we can pick from. Some of them make more sense, like the buttons are obviously buttons, but some of these other things are, are abstractions. So what we're going to do is it has this little search box down here. Um, we're going to create a label, just drop it in there. It's going to tell us how many friends we want. We're going to fill that in in a text field. We need a button. And that's going to make friends. These little blue lines are just guides that uh, are so many pixels apart from the different controls. And the number of pixels is defined in the human interface guidelines, which um, you know, you may or may not want to uh, go with. So we're also going to come in and pull a, a multi-line text field. So we're going to enter in um, how many friends we want. We're going to push the button, and it's going to go and, and make the friends. And then this uh, multi-line text field is just going to be for logging. It's going to show us what friend names were created. Um, so that's all well and good. Interface Builder lets us uh, simulate the interface. So instead of having to go back to uh, Xcode and build and go and see how it works when the user resizes or they tab, uh, that sort of thing, we can just do the simulate. 
and <coughs> we'll see, you know, nothing resizes right now. And if we make, we can make it, you know, completely invisible and uh, that's not good, but so we want to make the multi-line text field expandable. So if we um, want to see more names or whatnot, we can do that. Um, yeah. I'm trying to follow along. I don't have one of those. I've got an HTML, like a rich text one. Can you imagine why it wouldn't be showing up in my? College? If you type in text, you don't have a um, multi-line text field. No. You're on Leopard. Uh huh. What no, version of Xcode? Huh? What version of Xcode? That's a good uh, three, question. Yeah, I two think. Or three, one. Yeah, three, it might. Maybe they added it in three one. Okay. I'm somewhat surprised, but uh, you can just make that. Um, you can make that a, a, a text view. Text view. Yeah, and that should work fine, okay. and that'll actually work even better. But. Um, so we want this um, multi-line text field, and if you have questions, feel free to to jump in. But uh, we'll make this multi-line question, multi-line text field. Uh, we want it to grow width and height, and we want it to be bound to where it currently is um, on the, both the right and bottom edges as well. It was currently only bound to the uh, left and top. This um, is referred to as uh, springs and struts, and it's really cool uh, in that you can just you know drop it in there and say you know make this resize grow. Um, and you can do some fairly complex things with just that. So now if we go back uh, and we say simulate, it should now resize correctly. And, but when we shrink it all the way down, we can see at the top there it didn't quite do what we wanted. And really we don't want uh, the application ever to shrink that small anyway. So if we go to the window, we can say um, in the inspector, we can say that it has a minimum size, and that minimum size should be the current minimum size. And there's just a bunch of attributes for uh, each of the controls that you can change. So if we simulate that, we should be able to grow it but not shrink it, and that's good. Uh, so another thing um, Coco provides is uh, some formatters, so we can actually if we go to the library, <coughs> and is that better or is that not enough? Um, we can search for formatter, and there's this number formatter. So this how many, we don't want to accept just anything because we'll have to deal with that in our code. But we can tell um, Coco that we only want it to be numbers. <coughs> We want it to have a minimum of one, and there's all sorts of you know these different um, attributes you can set, and these constraints. And now, when we simulate, we should. Did I say print? Yeah. Um, if we type in five, it's not going to let us tab away. And it's just going to keep focus there. And that's because it wants a number. And now we can tab away. So it's kind of a nice thing. You don't have to worry about um, when you read that attribute, you don't, you don't have to worry about being a string or how big it was. Um, and it also, the default settings is it's an integer. So it's going to round for us. Um, and that's exactly, exactly what we want. So we're going to go with that. Um, now that we've sort of laid out our, our beautiful interface here, um, we have it functioning, the resize is working and whatnot. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, wire up the make friends button. So to do that, we need um, an application controller that's going to take receive the action and then do something with it. And before I do that, I'm going to go into this RB main, and this is really where all of the uh, startup stuff happens. You'll see it pulling in all the Ruby files in the bundle and whatnot. But this is where we're going to go. And we're going to require Ruby gems. And we're going to um, Faker. And while we're here, uh, there's, I also like to include the OS 10 module. <coughs> Otherwise, as you can sort of see down here, you have to prefix all your uh, references to Cocoa classes with OS 10 colon colon, and it, it gets old. Um, 
And I'm also going to pull in the address book framework. And you do that saying require framework address book. And now we'll have, once this compiles, we'll have access to um, all the address book stuff. So although if we were to, to look in our frameworks, we'll see that we're linking with Coco, but they don't for um, uh, reasons of you know trying having a link against a, a giant library, they break it out. So although Coco does cover address book and QuickTime and all this other stuff, when you actually start writing an application that you want to use those, um, they're actually in a, a, a sub framework of Coco, and in this case, it's address book. Uh, QuickTimes and Qt Kit and some other stuff. So we're going to do that, save that, and now we need to create our class that, our controller class. So you can put it anywhere, but they've got it broken out. Uh, you could create a controller subfolder, um, do it however, however you want. Um, say new file. And again, you know, it lists everything you can create. Uh, it defaults to uh, what you last did. So in the case of this, um, that's Ruby Coco and the NS object subclass. And that's what we need. Um, we're just going to create an application controller. We don't need all that stuff since uh, it's taken for taken care of us, taken care of for us by RB main. Um, and we need an action to be called. So now that we have our controller, um, we need to define uh, what gets called when they push the make friends button. So to do that, uh, RubyCoco has a uh, IB action function. And we're going to name it. You just say IB action make friends. And it takes a block. Uh, it takes an optional argument. Uh, all the actions in Coco um, take an argument, and that argument is whoever whoever sent you that um, action, it passes themselves as the sender. Uh, but we, in this case, we don't need it. Sometimes it's really handy if you were, for whatever reason, to have a button that called this, as well as like when the user double clicked on something in a table view, you might want to know did they click on the button or did they um, click on the table view. So all we're going to do in this case is just log a message. Um, so now that we've done that, it's actually done nothing. It's going to be included in our program, but uh, it's no one's ever going to call it. We have to go back to Interface Builder and wire up the Make Friends button. But in order to do that, um, the Make Friends button needs some way to know who the application controller is. So in this case, what we need to do is create an instance of the class. And we define this, take this um, NS object, and we're going to say that, that this instance is actually an instance of our application controller. And we tell it what it is in the inspector, uh, the class. And you'll see it auto-completes for us, uh, which is really nice. Xcode and Interface Builder uh, know about each other. You know they're monitoring the files, and uh, it parsed that. If I had a parse error in my um, application controller.rb, it actually wouldn't have auto-completed because it needs to know that it's a uh, inherits from NS object and that sort of things. But in this case, it was good and uh, found it for us. So now, yeah. How did you get that dialog of the main menu in IB? Uh, when you go to Interface Builder, it should if you're in Xcode. If you double click on um, in resources, if you double click on main menu .nib, uh -huh. should bring up interface builder, and that's the main window controlling the nib. So that that defines what's in the nib. So that should definitely be there. Oh, it might be you might see it like this. Like what? Which? Yeah. See the um, yeah. the bigger icons. Oh, right there. Uh, the. Yeah. the I prefer the um, outline view because you can actually drill down and see, you know, inside the window is a content view, uh, so that's handy. Um, so we've defined this now. When this nib loads, which in the case of main menu dot nib is immediately or during application start, uh, when this nib loads, it's going to create an instance of our application controller. 
um, and it'll send it some, some messages that we may or not uh, respond to, and we'll talk about that in a second. But we can now talk, this button can now talk to this nib, and one of the cooler things in Interface Builder is how you assign um, the actions. So in this case, um, you, you, can you can either double click it, and you can go down to, uh, or I think in the case, I'm sorry, not double click, but right click it. Um, and we have to do it, you have to do it backwards in that case. Sorry, I'm not prepared for that. But you can say, make friends and drag it to uh, who is going to be sending that. And in that case, it would be the make friends button. But I don't want to do that. Um, I prefer to drag from the action to the receiver. So in the case of you hold down control, click on the button or whatever it is that's sending the message and drag it over to the controller. It's going to pop up all the um, methods that are defined with, um, or all the blocks that are defined as um, IB actions. And in this case, we just have the one make friends. It's now wired up. You can see all the uh, connections that are made in uh, this button connections in the inspector. So we've successfully wired that up. So now, when we start our program, we'll have an instance of our application controller, and the button should send us this message. And we're going to have to go back to Xcode to see the log, and it logged it. And every time we push it, it logs it. <laughs> so that's a step in the right direction. Now we need to wire up the, uh, the how many. And we're going to do that um, with bindings. One thing we could do is uh, in our code, we could say um, we could set up an outlet that says um, make friends text field. And we could wire up the text field to the controller. And then the controller could query the text field. Uh, but that whole KVC, KVO stuff, and the bindings that I talked about makes it such that in a, such a simple case like this, uh, the text field can control the value of your um, property. So some people like it, some people really hate it because um, they want to, you know, have written out explicitly everything they want uh, going on in their between their controllers and their view. Uh, but in this case, we're going to use it. So to do that, we go back to Xcode, and since it's going to be a property of our application controller, we just come in here and we use another uh, Ruby Coco uh, nicety KVC accessor. Um, number of friends. And now when we go back to Interface Builder, we can click on that text field. We can go to the bindings portion of the inspector. And it gives you a handful of different uh, bindings to, to make. And in this case, we want to bind the value. So anytime the user needs to see the value and anytime um, the user changes the value, it's going to go to our application controller and either set or get whatever we tell it. And in this case, we're telling it number, <coughs> of, number of friends. <coughs> There's some attributes. You can do some um, validation and, and whatnot um, and this transformer stuff. So if it was a Boolean, you could say, um, you know, negate it before I ever see it. That sort of thing that's useful for checkbox, you know, whether something's enabled or checkboxes, um, things like that. So now our text field is or our text field is wired up to our number of friends. We can come in here and we now have a number of friends method we can call. And I briefly touched on this before uh, when I was talking about the bridging between Ruby and uh, Objective-C. <laughs> the number of friends, since we set the uh, number formatter on it, it's going to come to us as an NS number. Uh, it's not going to come to us as a, normally it would come to us as a string, but since we told it to validate it as a number, it's going to help us out and send us um, an NS number, which could be, in the case of NS number, it could be a double, a float, and whatnot. We know it's going to be an integer. Uh, it's already been rounded for us, but in order to call dot times on it, we have to make it a Ruby integer. So we call 2i times do, and we'll just log our message for now. Sorry, and if we, I've been using the keyboard shortcut, but the little tool, the build and go is what I've been using. Um, 
it just compiles everything and then runs the application. So now if we say we want five friends, go back to the console, I printed the log message five times, pretty <coughs> much what we wanted. So now we want to, let's actually use the faker gem and say that f name equals faker name dot first name, l name equals faker name last name. So now we should have a, a generated first and last name um, from faker. And we'll just log that now. We've already required it uh, before in the RB main because we knew we were going to be using Faker and whatnot. Um, the text field, in the case where it's using bindings, it's not actually going to call the, the set method on our attribute um, until I tab away from the field, then it knows that I've ended editing. You can do some things to say, um, that it should you know, constantly update that field. And that's useful in the case, or usually more useful in the case of sliders where you want the slider to immediately affect um, like the contrast or something. Um, but in that case, I hadn't tabbed away, so it, the value is still nil, and we did it no times. And now we've got five um, generated names. So we're again moving in the right direction. Um, and at this point, we're done with, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. Now let's uh, log those messages to the interface. So we're gonna just put, instead of logging them to the console and having to look back and see what they were, we're just gonna plop them in this uh, multi-line text field. And to do that, we're also gonna use bindings. And we're just gonna call it log. Go back to interface builder. We've already got the bindings inspector up. Um, and we just say that we want to bind it to our application controller. And it's just listing everything that the nib knows about here. Uh, if we had other controllers that could be bound to, they'd show up here um, as like the files owner application and whatnot do. So we just called it log. So in the case of how many we were, uh, the user was sending us the value. And in this case, we're pushing the value. Um, and bindings just work both ways. Um, <laughs> So now instead of ns log, we can do self.log equals put a carriage return at the end, and then the rest of the log. And since we're um, <laughs> adding the string value of the, the log here, we need to uh, initialize it before we can add it. Otherwise, it'll crash saying that uh, self.log returned nil. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to use this awake from nib method. And I talked about before when we when um, our controller is when an object is instantiated from the nib. So because the nib is loading itself, uh, it's going to send some messages. One of those messages is that um, this awake from nib. It means uh, you know everything's wired up, bindings are good to go. Uh, if there's a, a view, the user is about to see it. Um, that sort of thing. So this is a perfect place for us just to say self.log equals nothing or empty string rather. And if all went well, say we want five friends and they show up here now. And it's just going to keep adding them. Uh, so now we want to, that's Ruby Coco interacting with um, the UI and stuff. But <coughs> Really, it would be nice to, or to really, the point of this application is to use the address book um, framework in Coco to push them to um, push the names into the address book. And you could actually see a use for this if you were building an application that used the, you know, a pure Coco application that used the address book framework. You'd want to test it with, you know, 2,000 <laughs> records or, or some thousands of records. Um, so this would be a great little tool for that. And um, it would be easy to generate with uh, Ruby Coco as we're doing here. So I'm going to cheat for a second. And I'm going to pull in this uh, text clipping that just has the code written out for me. 
to save some time and, more importantly, save some uh, typos. So, but we'll go through it line by line. Um, we allocate this AB person address book has a set of classes. One of them is AB person. Uh, you can also create uh, groups in address book. But here we're creating a person. We're going to call through the API the set value for property for first name, last name. We're passing our Ruby strings. Um, even though these, this set value for property uh, wants an NS string. And in the case here, the second parameter is the property, and it's a constant um, defined in uh, the address book framework. And the way we're going to reference that is with the OS 10 colon colon, and then capital K AB first name property. If you look in the documentation, um, they do, the address book frameworks define it as lowercase k. We have to make it uh, uppercase for Ruby, so we go, they go ahead and take care of that for us. So we set first name, last name. We add the record, and then we uh, save the address book off. And this address book dot shared address book returns the system copy of the address book. So <laughs> when we run this, we're going to be um, adding these names to my address book. And we'll see that when we're done. And then we're going to save it. And this save really wants to be outside of the loop here because we just want to save when we're done. So I think, again, if all went well, we're done with the UI. We're going to create some names. Let's create 10 friends. Goes ahead and creates them. And this is a smart group that just says, uh, show me all the people with no emails and no phone numbers. So that matches our uh, gene Alfterhar should uh, show up here. So we're creating them. Um, and that's Ruby Coco, uh, a little example of how to create a potentially useful application. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, why you would use Ruby Coco. And also, I'll talk about why not. Uh, it's Ruby. It's you know a language. If we're here, we clearly uh, enjoy working with it. Uh, you have access to all the gems. Um, you saw the require Ruby gems. You can require <laughs> whatever gem you want. And in the case of GitNub, it uses, I think, uh, the open for gem, if I'm right. And they actually ship that with the application, so you don't need to worry about if it's on the system. And you just put it in the bundle, and you require it from out of your application bundle. So uh, just to make that more clear, an, an application in OS 10 is just really a, a special folder. Um, and you can have whatever you want within that folder. If you right click on an app and say, show package contents, you can drill down and see what's in there. Um, you can actually, with IRB, you can uh, talk to this stuff. I, was, I went over the, the friend faker thing on my flight into Austin. And I used IRB. You just require OS 10 slash Coco. Um, you say that OS 10, that require framework. And you can just start working away with those classes, uh, assuming you're not doing anything with Windows and whatnot. It's, it's great. And so if you want to play around with NSArray and see how it acts and, or whatever class, um, you can do that. And as we saw, it's great for fast prototyping. You know, if this was an uh, application we wanted to you know, just see how it, how it worked out, um, we could use Ruby Coco for that. And uh, it's pretty good for that. And it's Coco. Um, it looks correct. It feels correct. And it's fun. Um, I've got a sort of strong opinion that uh, you know, WX widgets and even now Adobe Air, they, they definitely have a place. And there's applica you can make great, great applications with them. But really, if you're, you're creating, uh, you want that standard look and feel, you really have to use the, the packet or the, what's available on whichever OS you're on. Um, and in the case of OS 10, that's uh, definitely Coco. And the reason just, you know, the different operating systems act different. Uh, tab orders are different. You know, some things are probable. <laughs> and you just really want Coco to make sure you get that. Otherwise, you know, if you're trying to do a cross-platform app, uh, what is correct on Windows isn't correct on OS 10, and you know it doesn't always work out well. Uh, so why not Ruby Coco? Um, that jumped a little there. Uh, performance. Uh, if you're doing something performance critical, you can certainly call into Coco and let that rip away, rip away at it. But uh, you're always going to have the cost of 
crossing between uh, the two worlds. So you're, every time you go to, from Ruby to Coco, you know, it has to say, are you an array? OK, now you're an NS array. Um, and on the way back, uh, so there's some, there's some cost to that. Um, and unless you do anything about it, uh, your .rb files just ship in that bundle that I talked about. So you can say to GitNub, you can say, or any Ruby Cocoa app, you can say show package contents, and you can see the .rb file and all their code. Uh, you may or may not care if it's an open source app like Ruby Cocoa, um, GitNub, you definitely don't care. Um, but if you're trying to make a commercial app, you could have to jump through some hoops to make sure you know, it's not super easy for them to steal it. Um, but you know, some, some packages just put it out there and say, please pay for it, and do very little. Um, the debugging was you know, just not so great uh, compared to um, working with an Objective-C Cocoa app. And I'm not so sure what's going on if they're working on that or if I'm just missing something completely. So what next? If you want to do this, I actually recommend learning Objective-C. You really want to learn um, how Objective-C works, how the, uh, the Cocoa frameworks are actually talking to each other and whatnot. And to do that, uh, this gentleman wrote a really good book that uh, myself and a lot of people recommend, uh, Cocoa Programming for Mac OS X. It covers Objective-C, or it's all in Objective-C. Um, and it goes through a lot, and it's really well written. Uh, it's in its third edition. Third one just came out, covers uh, the new Leopard stuff. <coughs> uh, there's also a, a new book from the Pragmatic Programmers that I have not checked out, um, but it's in a beta PDF, I think, um, specifically about Ruby Cocoa. Um, I imagine that'll be good as well. So the future. Ruby Cocoa actually has um, some competition in MacRuby, and I think that was mentioned this morning. Um, Mac Ruby is Ruby implemented in the uh, Objective-C runtime, sort of. I, my understanding is that uh, that's very much like um, JRuby in that it's got its own gem repository and whatnot. And it's at, in that case, it, it bypasses the, uh, the bridge and it's talking directly to Cocoa classes and whatnot. And it looks pretty promising. Um, it's being developed. Uh, by Apple, open source, um, but they are going to fully support it. Uh, they do claim to, they'll still support Ruby Coco. They had, um, adopted Ruby Coco in, App, in, in Leopard, and I don't think they're going to just drop that. And for the most part, um, the stuff you learn, Mac Ruby right now isn't quite ready for um, even, like, I don't, at least with the version that's published, we couldn't do that. Um, the friend faker because we couldn't actually talk to gems uh, with Mac Ruby yet. There's, a, I think, in October is in is their next release, and it's supposed to have gem support and some other really good stuff. Um, so the obvious question is: Is Mac Ruby going to be in Snow Leopard? And nobody knows. They don't. You can be talking to Apple, um, and they're really nice people. It, it, at one time, I was at WWDC talking to them about some Coco stuff, and you can there's just you know humans, and you're talking to them, and all of a sudden you ask them, well, will this be fixed or whatever in the next release, and they just turn into these robots like we do not talk about future products. <laughs> so, so who knows? Um, but Mac Ruby, uh, you can see the first two lines is the first one's Objective C, then Ruby Coco, and I talked about it a little bit. You know, you have to do this jump through these underscore hoops. Um, Mac Ruby takes care of that uh, with a new little extension to Ruby that just set, lets them say, instead of having to do the underscore game, you can uh, pass the name of the parameter. Uh, and it's just nicer. There's no real benefit. Um, I added this at the last minute. But uh, Tim Burks um, spent a lot of time. He wrote a lot of the articles on rubycoco.com. And uh, he did a lot of Ruby Cocoa work. And he got frustrated with it, um, with the, how the bridge worked. So he started, and in January of, I think, 07, he um, published uh, Ruby Obj-C, uh, which, which would be an alternative to Ruby Cocoa. And some months after that, he got frustrated with that and dropped that. And he came up with new. New is um, Lisp with like a Ruby spin to it. And it talks to um, Cocoa. And it does it much like um, 
I'm actually not sure how the bridge works, or if there is no bridge, like in the case of MacRuby, but uh, I'm pretty sure that's the scenario where there's, where there's no bridge. It's implemented in the VM. Uh, so thank you. Here's some links um, that uh, were covered. The, I'll put my slides and that demo application. I'll check into GitHub at uh, brightcook slash LSRC RubyCoco. Uh, and if we have time, I'll take questions. I'm writing a, a command line Ruby script. Is there a way to uh, instantiate like DNS window objects and stuff <laughs> from the script itself without <laughs> having to use interface builders like that kind of thing? Yeah, uh, you, you can. It's, um, you can program all the NS window stuff and you can work with the um, uh, layout manager directly, but... Um, can you still have like a neat, short, quick script? No, it'll be, it'll be, yeah, yeah, because you're going to have to do a lot of drawing yourself and positioning. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So that program you wrote, if you write something else that you discovered it was very good and you wanted to take it make it more of the performance issues and stuff like that. Could you use all the visual stuff and just swap out the Ruby for Objective-C and then yep. compile it into all the so, so the question was, could we take that Ruby Cocoa app and uh, turn it into an Objective-C app with just uh, leaving the views there? And you definitely can. Um, you'll need to rewire everything up. So an interface builder where I wired up um, the make friends button to <coughs> that class, you're just going to have to redo that stuff. Uh, so, but as far as the visual layout goes, you can definitely keep that. That's Coco specific and, uh, and no worries there. Uh, I think we'll go here and then. Did you, uh, did you use any, um, or have you used any mocking frameworks over top of these frameworks and, and what is the experience with that when you start? For like testing and stuff? Yeah. I haven't. There are some, uh, some blog articles about doing uh, TDD and BDD with Ruby Coco, but I, I have no experience there. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering, you know, can you mix Ruby and Objective-C in the same project, or is it going to fall No, oh, I'm sorry. You definitely can. Um, yeah, I was supposed to talk about that. But in the case of uh, that Croak app that I showed you, uh, there's a, a session ID, or not a session ID, but a, a API token that Hoptoad app gives you. And I store that in uh, the keychain. And there's no Cocoa um, framework for working with the keychain. So somebody published an Objective-C wrapper around um, the, the, what they call Carbon, which is just their straight C interface. They wrapped it in Car um, Coco, and I included that in the project. You just have to tell uh, Ruby that it exists, and then once you do that, and once it's in your, your project and compiled, you can call it. And so you can, you can include it uh, straight Objective-C files, um, or you can actually have, if somebody published a third-party framework, um, a good case of this is like uh, Sparkle, is the auto updater framework, and GitNub uses that. They talk to the framework. It's Sparkle's written in Cocoa. A lot of Cocoa um, Objective C apps use it, but Ruby Cocoa can talk to it no problem. Uh, and you can yeah define your own whatnot. So, any other questions? Yeah. Sure. I mean, it's Ruby, so. <laughs> Uh, you can do whatever you want when you're in your when your Ruby code's being executed, um, whatever you want. Uh, limited to, uh, well, this is more of a limit, limitation when you're talking to Coco, but uh, you can't use any of the um, threading stuff that Coco provides. So there's some pretty cool distributed object stuff that it does. Um, all that's out, but that's coming with uh, Mac Ruby. That'll all be available. So, but as far as um, Pure Ruby stuff, when you're in Ruby, it's, it's Ruby, so. And it just runs whatever Ruby is on the machine already? Uh, it runs the system library one that, that it comes with. So if you hand built uh, and put it in like user local bin or something, it should stay away from that one. Um, you could probably tell it to, you know, re <laughs> relink whatever, and if you wanted a different version of Ruby. Um, but, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Say, um, how about between like Tiger and Will that application run? If you're trying to ship an application that runs on, the question was between differences between Tiger and Leopard. Ruby Coco was only adopted um, for Leopard as far as Apple's concerned. So if you're running Tiger, 
the only way you're going to have to manually install Ruby Cocoa. Um, so at that point, you get whatever version of Ruby Cocoa you have at the time. So right. I think we're done. Um, thank you. That was fun. Video equipment rental costs paid for by Peepcode Screencasts.